Thank you, David. That was uh, an epic kickoff and a, a great wager. And by now, uh, you'll understand why David is the uh, Thomas Paine of our time. You've just, uh, you've just heard the philosophical cousin of Paine's pamphlet. Some of you might remember from your high school days, titled Common Sense, which 250 years ago played a major role in the American Revolution. In our time, it's no less revolutionary than it was two centuries ago to push back against any political orthodoxy. And we're at a time again that cries out for the rediscovery of common sense, especially when it comes to energy policies. Today's ruling energy orthodoxy, as all of you know, is the idea that the world is undergoing or could undergo an energy transition. No one attending here or listening needs to be told what that phrase means. But for the record, the idea is that we can radically reduce, if not eliminate, the use of hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and uh, coal. Those three fuels, again, as the energy cognoscenti in this room know, supply over 80% of America and the world's energy needs. But that fact, which is still not widely known, understates reality. Hydrocarbons are used everywhere, somehow, in 100% of what we build and use in civilization. The goal of the transition is not only to change that fact, but to do so rapidly. That pursuit is the key mission of the ill-named Inflation Reduction Act, wherein that legislation is dominantly directed at funding, mandating, and coercing actions to seek an energy transition. It is a government enterprise that is arguably unprecedented in American history, certainly in the history of industrial programs. A proper accounting of the IRA reveals that its real costs were far greater than the as advertised cost before it was passed. It will likely deploy a total of two to three trillion dollars in pursuit of the energy transition. For context, in inflation adjusted terms, the United States deployed four trillion dollars to prosecute World War II. That level of spending, complemented by similar pursuits in dozens of states, is one of the defining issues of our times. It's no exaggeration to say that the realities, the physics, the engineering, the economics of energy systems are now squarely in the middle of the future of the U.S. economy and thus unavoidably at the center of policy and political debates. It may be obvious, but I'll state it again, that it's not just that society as we know it and that life itself would not exist, but for vast supplies of energy. Energy is consumed by every invention every product, every service that makes life not only possible, but safe, interesting, convenient, enjoyable, even beautiful. Energy policies are bets on ensuring there's enough energy to meet the demands of what people will need and want now, and critically, and in the future. But there is a foundational truth, one that's relevant for forecasters and policymakers, and it's that over all of history, innovators have invented far more ways to consume energy than to produce it. One of humanity's remarkable capabilities is that we invent future wants, and thus we invent new energy demands. There is no energy demand for air conditioning before its invention. There was no energy used for flying until the airplane. To note a couple of other obvious examples, the same is true for the car, for pharmaceuticals, and for computing. The global computing ecosystem now uses more energy than global aviation and the former is growing far faster than the latter, and now comes artificial intelligence, AI. In energy terms, AI is to computers what jet engines are to aircraft. Energy policies are thus also bets on what it's possible to build and supply those needs. Supply follows demand, but a lack of supply can kill demand. The past and the present offer a lot of examples of the large swaths of unmet needs, not just in America, but around the world. And when it comes to supplying energy, there is kind of a ironclad hierarchy. One first needs, self-evidently, enough energy. You can't consume what you don't produce. And energy shortfalls not only stifle economic growth, but if severe, are lethal. Then energy abundance has to be cheap. Affordability matters. The visible political touchstone, of course, for that reality is the price of a gallon of gasoline. More hidden is the industrial touchstone, which is the combined price of hydrocarbons and electricity. Ignoring that latter reality is what, uh, as David noted earlier, is causing the United Kingdom and Germany to sink into economically destructive deindustrialization. 
And the third feature of the ironclad energy hierarchy is reliability at all scales and at all time frames. Reliability is not only about meeting energy needs of people and machines and systems minute by minute, but also over days, weeks, months, and years. The absence of energy when needed can crash not just machines, but economies. Reliability is the inverse of fragility in energy systems and supply chains. Reliability is a sine qua non that allows low-cost abundance to be taken for granted. High reliability always means that energy is an issue sort of shrinks into the twilight of everyday concerns. But re reliability for engineers, systems planners, is the Sisyphean battle that one is always fighting because you're designing and building energy supply chains to combat the realities of the relentless and often malevolent interferences that come from nature, from accidents, and of course from humans. There's kind of a complex kabuki dance in simultaneously balancing that triumvirate of needs, abundance, affordability, reliability. And how that dance can be performed is fundamentally dictated, you know, I'll reveal my bias, by the physics of energy and how it is manifested in systems that we can build and that we can afford. You could call it the physics of money. You'll not have missed that I have made no mention of the environment in that ironclad energy hierarchy. Abundant, affordable, and reliable energy create the conditions for wealth that in turn make possible the time and capital for everything else beyond mere survival, from healthcare to entertainment, as well as and especially for the modern luxury of environmental protection. You break that virtuous circle and we know what happens. Over history and around the world today, we've seen the correlation between environmental degradation and poverty. Thus, it was predictable that energy pundits would rediscover the energy hierarchy with all the hype around the most recent and recently invented energy using infrastructure. I'm referring, of course, to AI, artificial intelligence. AI is a pure example of the invention of energy demands. Electric utilities around the country are now reporting epic jumps in forecasts for near-term power demand. The end of the interregnum of flat growth in electric demand comes not because of enthusiasm for electric vehicles, nor because of the repatriation of semiconductor factories. Both those are significant new demand vectors. But it comes because of the fact that the so-called virtual world of software can only exist within the physical world of energy-hungry hardware. The cloud, whether measured in terms of the size of the network, the capital deployed, or the energy used, is on track to become the biggest infrastructure ever built by humanity. Global capital spending on energy using hardware to build the cloud and its networks now exceeds the global capital spending by all electric utilities on energy producing power plants and their networks. For context today, today the global cloud already consumes 10 times more electricity than all the world's EVs combined. And even if EV adoption expands at the rate that the enthusiasts think, the cloud will still outpace the electricity demand of EVs and by a lot, and especially now with the rush to buy AI hardware. And we're still in early, day, early days of AI adoption. To continue with the AI and jet engine analogy, the aviation industry had been booming for three decades before the 1958 introduction of the first viable commercial jet aircraft, the Boeing 707. Some of you of a certain age may have actually flown on one. After that game, changer, flying it measured in passenger miles vaulted over tenfold in under a decade and continued soaring, and energy use followed. Mark Andreessen, Silicon Valley pioneer and venture capital potentate, said over a decade ago that he, he expected software, famous line he coined, software would eat the world. But that he meant software would disrupt large swaths of the economy. He was right, but he may not have imagined then that the hardware that makes the software possible would eat the grid. And do you think AI is the last energy using innovation that will ever emerge? Of course not, the question answers itself. And that says nothing about the energy implications of billions of people who seek economic growth to rise out of poverty and come to enjoy the benefits of yesterday's inventions from air conditioning to cars and to vacations using airplanes. For all practical purposes and the time frames that matter, new demands for energy are unlimited and if we employ common sense, so too are new supplies. To return to Mark Andreessen, 
He has more recently issued a long and passion techno-optimist's manifesto, which I commend to you to read if you haven't read it. It includes a specific section on energy. That manifesto observes, and I'll quote it precisely, quote, we believe energy should be in an upward spiral. Energy is the foundational engine of our civilization. The more energy we have, the more people we can have, and the better everyone's lives can be, end quote. From Silicon Valley, to which I say, of course, amen. So let's turn to the abundance wager that David has put in play. I have one of my own suggestions for a wager in the tradition of the great Julian Simon, his bets of days of yore. And a uh, personal aside, Julian happened to have been a, both a friend and a neighbor, a delightful and brilliant man. I take the bet in the Simon tradition that over the coming decade, we'll see global energy rise, not shrink. I take the bet that global production and use of hydrocarbons will expand and not contract in parallel with rising alternative energy use and production. And I take the bet that we'll see the abandonment of the idea of an energy transition. These bets all derive from the primacy of the iron law of the energy hierarchy, the demand for abundance, affordability, and reliability. And when it comes to bets and forecasts, the visible, the not, it's not a hidden elephant in the room, and I haven't used the word, is the climate debate. And the, it is the motivation for the energy transition, as everyone watching or listening knows. But it matters not a whit what one thinks about climate science when it comes to analyzing the physics and economics of energy systems that we know how to build. They are entirely independent magisteria. And that's why this energy form is constructed the way it is. Our purpose today is to help illuminate energy realities for precisely the reasons that David and I have highlighted. And for that, we've brought together uh, leading experts and thinkers across the energy landscape to engage in one-on-one -on -one conversations about the realities of where we are, where we might go, talk about challenges. And as I promised, uh, David promised in advance in the promotion, this is a PowerPoint-free zone. So, <laughs> there are no PowerPoints except backdrop slides. This is to facilitate candor. There are no canned speeches except, to some extent, what David and I have uh, importuned you with. I want to thank David, in fact, David DeRocher, the Real Clear Foundation, for making this Energy Future Forum possible. And I have to also thank Heritage Foundation and the President Kevin Roberts for providing us a spectacular venue. And Greg Sindelar, who's the President of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, who is in the room. I don't think Kevin is in the room. Uh, oh, Kevin is in the room. Greg's Greg is here for us. Uh, being the anchor and the sponsor for the new National Center for Energy Analytics, which I have the honor of, uh, of founding and directing. So let me briefly, in just a few seconds, introduce your interlocutors. These are my friends who have agreed, have been uh, dragooned into participating in the interlocutions of uh, our guests. Uh, these are uh, wonderful humans who have the abundance of the future in their, in their heart and in their mind. Uh, I'll introduce them quickly in order in which you'll hear from them. We're going to rotate through interlocutors so that you don't get uh, over uh, Im imbued with the style of any one of us talking to our guests. First is Peter Bryant, though originally from New Zealand. He has flown in from his adopted home in Los Angeles where he serves as board chair of Clario, a global consultancy with a particular focus on mines, minerals, and energy. Peter also leads an informal global coalition of mining companies and policymakers, about which you'll be hearing much more from us at the National Center. Then Rupert Darwall will be up, has flown in from the United Kingdom, where he resides, but his intellectual home, his new philosophical home, is in Washington, D.C., as a senior fellow at the Real Clear Foundation. Earlier, Rupert was a special advisor to the United Kingdom's Chancellor of the Exchequer. I, I love British titles. My father was a squadron leader. It's a much nicer title than commander, I think. Earlier, Rupert was, was also, uh, he's also author of two books, and one, in, one in the oven, and myriad articles and, and on energy realities. And then Scott Tinker, who flew in from the great state of Texas, which some in Washington, of course, think is another country. Certainly Texans often do. Where he now runs an energy education empire, among other things, and hosts a PBS TV series called Energy Switch, which I commend to you. You can find it on the magic YouTube machine. Scott recently retired as the director of the School of Economic Geology, which is a wonderful title uh, because it blends the two domains. And it, he was, a, it was and remains an emeritus professor of geology at the University of Texas. So now, uh, 
as David said, we can let the planetary abundance games begin. Thank you.